Hey, tell them they need to go downstairs. Okay, Kevin. Hello, everyone. My name is Jay Young. Welcome to the latest episode of Young Red Angus Live. I am your host, obviously, Jay Young. Uh, I created the Young Red Angus Live show so that we could get people uh, on the show that have positively impacted my life uh, in the area of soil health or in the area of cattle or composting or, or whatever it is. And so uh, to I, I'm lining up guests um, speakers, uh, farmers, scientists, uh, to be able to bring you guys the information and knowledge that you need uh, to be better equipped to be better uh, farming or farmers or ranchers or whatever it is that you watch Young Red Angus for. So this episode is no different. Today, we have uh, a friend of mine and my mentor, Kevin Wiltsey. So Kevin is my mentor in the farms program. He has been in regenerative agriculture for the last 20 years, Kevin. Yeah, we started no-till in the late 90s. So, yeah. So Danger. anyway, um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Kevin and Kevin's going to share with you guys what his journey was into the area of soil health. Well, thanks, Jay, for having me on. Um, I would say it all started for us. You know, like I said, in the late 90s, we went to Dakota Lakes Research Farm with Dwayne Beck. And I was fortunate enough that my dad went along with me. And and we came back from there, just convinced that we needed to start, you know, doing no-tillage, um, no-till practices. We uh, So we got home from there and we sold all the tillage equipment and ordered a brand new no-till drill. And um, so we got started with that. We came back with a kind of the belief, I guess, that, um, you know, if we had a good crop rotation and did no tillage over time, we would see organic matters increase and infiltration increase. Um, and after several years of that, we kind of realized that just no till by itself wasn't enough um, after 15, 20 years. So then we started hearing about cover crops and that sort of thing and like mid, like 2006-ish, somewhere in there, 2008, we started, somewhere in that time frame, started uh, implementing cover crops and, and uh, to be honest, had a lot of mixed results with them. Um, so I guess the next advance probably in my soil health journey probably was after the drought of 11, 12, and 13. You know, those were some really dry years and just a realization that we weren't really seeing the improvements we wanted to see. So so that led me to really start down a path of um, perennial sequences in our cropland to see how fast we could rapidly improve our soil health. Um, and then since then, it's just really kind of snowballed into learning more about the biology and understanding the diversity, the importance of diversity and, and then implementing cover crops and, and even more grazing than what we were doing and managing our grazing and that sort of thing. So, so that's kind of been my journey. There's been a lot of hiccups along the way, but that's kind of where we're at today. So. So Kevin, what year did you go to ranching for profit and what impact did ranching for profit have on your operation? So we, my wife and I attended Ranching for Profit in the summer of 2017. Um, so we were implementing perennials and stuff before, you know, that time frame. Mostly, mostly my interest in implementing perennial sequences was at the beginning was how can we rapidly increase soil health to get our infiltration rates up and organic matter up? Because we just weren't seeing that with no tillage alone and even with no tillage and, and intermittent cover crops. So that was kind of, you know, where we were at, um, at the time, you know, coming out of that drought, um, there was some really tough financial years for us. And there were some changes of my dad's health had declined at the time. And, and, uh, like, you know, my story about, I had an opportunity to rent, um, a bunch of land, irrigated land. And so we were just really struggling with making some decisions. Um, on the future of the farm. So Mandy and I went to uh, 
the ranching for profit. And we came back from there and I would, you know, I, I don't know if people really understand that, but how the, attending that really changed the direction of our business and my life. So, um, so yeah, that's when, when we attended it, I guess. Um, the how thing, did, how, did, how did that change your perspective? Like when you got back, because when you got back, that's when you turned down the yep. irrigated ground. So what was it, the catalyst that made you realize that you wanted to do things and shift your perspective? Um, a couple of things. One, kind of in the back of my mind, I, you know, when we're doing all our financials and stuff on this rented ground, you know, we're just really not making a lot of money and we're doing a lot of work. Um, so that, that was probably part of it, but, but by far and away, the biggest, the thing that changed, um, changed for me was Manny and I got to sit down with, uh, Alan Crocker was our instructor and Dave Pratt was, he was the one that, that owned RMC at the time. Um, and we sat down with them and we went through this ICA process where we put together a goal. Um, and I'd been through holistic management courses before back, gosh, I would say 2010-ish or so, maybe. Um, so I really, you know, and they they talk about the importance of having a holistic goal as well. Understood that and what the importance of that goal was. But we really had a, and Manny and I, we sat down for almost a whole day and tried to write a goal. Um, and that's a hard thing to do, like as a couple. Yeah. Um, so we really got nowhere. Until we went to Ranch for Profit, we went through this ICA process with them. They they're really good at giving you tools to um, to do some of these processes. And so, in a matter of half an hour, we had a goal written down on a piece of paper that that not only showed what I want for our farm and the family and the business and the landscape, but also what Mandy wanted. So this was a goal. Um, that we use to this day. I keep this goal on my phone. And uh, whenever there's decisions that need to be made, um, I'll get this out and read it. And and that's how we make make most of our decisions. Or, you know, do this, does this, um, whatever decision we're trying to make, does it fit this goal that we set? And uh, that's really probably changed the course of our farm more than anything. So that's awesome. So when you got into perennials, like how many perennials did you, well, let me ask this question first on that. When you got into perennials, were you thinking that you would go, you would heal the soil and that you would go back to cash crops? Or were you specifically thinking we're going to go to on a direction where we were able to graze more cattle and be more efficient with grazing cattle and rotational grazing? Um, and that that's, there's probably more than one answer to that as well, but cause we're trying to, we're kind of doing all of that. Um, so some of the, some of the land, my intention was to put in a perennial sequence for, you know, a period of time, five or six years or whatever, and then take it out and crop it again, annual cropping. Um, part of it is just, so you got to understand my context too, of where we farm and ranch our soil types um, and everything. And part of it is just the function of their inputs are so high. Can we make more money, you know, if we manage our grazing um, on this perennial conversion on our crop land? Can we can that compete economically with with annual cropping without all of the, you know, the expenses? We have no inputs other than, you know, once we got our perennials established, our infrastructure in place with water and fencing. You know, basically our only input now is the time it takes to manage the grazing. Um, and we also knew um, that we wanted to build this system, this farm and ranch that was very resilient and very flexible um, and very, yeah, so to, so so in my mind, I wanted to have um, a perennial base and more livestock, more cows, or whatever class of animal you want to run, 
Sure. Um, so have a perennial base for that, but then still have the options and the flexibility with our cropland. Um, yeah, to grow cover crops or cash crops or forage crops, kind of whatever, you know, the market kind of tells us what what to do or what we need for forage as well. So, okay. And what have, what has the results been when you go out and you take your, your sharpshooter shovel and you dig into the soil, what are you seeing with your ground that is cover crop, cash crop rotation compared to your perennial grasses? Um, so without question, the perennials, increases the aggregation in the soil like the structure changes um pretty rapidly like we see changes in three years you know that we've been struggling to get in 20 years of no tillage which we haven't got in 20 years of no tillage um in our particular soils you can see like the platiness in the soil where the um you get these short fallow periods and the biology collapses and once you get those perennial systems in there, literally just in a matter of years, that all disappears. Um, just the perennial root mass is just so incredible. Um, now, we do have some annual cropping fields where we have been a lot more intense with cover crops. Like basically the last 10 years or so, we've done nothing but cover crop and graze type of systems, used them predominantly just for a forage based system where we're. We have, we're just a lot more aggressive, I would say, with our cropping. And those soils have improved, you know, pretty substantially as well. But do you think that they're comparable to the perennials or do you think the no, perennials will be? Not structure wise, not aggregation wise. Um, no comparison. So, so do you think it's because the, the perennials, the, the aggregates and the root structure on perennials just is so much more? Um, aggressive or just I think so just that fibrous root and we're you know our perennial most of the perennials you know we're seeding eight 17 to 18 different mixes or species in that mix so it's, it's a very diverse mix um plus there's green roots in there 365 days a year um so yeah I I think that's that's what's going on I mean that's how mother nature did it she sure these soils were built with perennial systems and grazing animals so so in your perennial systems do you have predominantly cool season with some warm mixes in some of them and then others that have predominantly warm mix with some cool season and how did you how did what research went into looking into what would work in in your area of Kansas um when we first started like the first fields were we kind of went down to NRCS and kind of did their native range mix for the first couple fields, which wasn't enough diversity. Um, then we then we implemented our first kind of a, we wanted a cool season pasture. And my thought on that one was that would be just a short term, like a five year um, perennial sequence. And then that field would go back to annual cropping. And that one as well doesn't have quite the diversity that I would like to see. So I haven't been incredibly thrilled with that pasture, but that'll be coming out probably here in another year or so. Um, but our my, my favorite mixes where we have the 17, 18, 20 different species, um, those mixes really come as a result is from a conversation um, Jim, with Jim Garrish. It's kind of where it started. And he kind of made a list of what he would like to see in this area um and then i so that was probably the first one we did we kind of followed his recommendation and then after seeing that established we've kind of tweaked them since um after um consoling with uh doug spencer he's with nrcs out of eastern kansas a range specialist um he's been a good resource for me um and and so we've kind of tweaked that as well so to get to the mix where we are today and so in those mixes that you have now what like what's the breakdown on on cool season and warm season in there and what are some okay. of those that are in there yeah um do you want me to tell you what it is you can run it off the top of your head and then I, we can leave it in the notes for for people to read later like later on after the live event too. so yeah the so obviously there's a lot of the natives you know we have the 
the big blue, the little blue, Indian grass, switch grass, side oats, blue grama. Um, for the warm season grasses, the cool season, we had Canada wild rye and intermediate wheat grass. Um, there's some alfalfa in there. There's Illinois bundle flower, uh, Maximilian sunflower, um, lead plant. Gosh, I know I'm leaving some out. <laughs> Have you noticed any of them dying out over time or because you're able to do the rotational grazings, all 17 of those species of... of yeah, the, uh, um, and Sice or Milk Vetch is another one we put in. And that one, I had several people say that it wouldn't survive our climate, and but it has. It's That's been one that I've been really impressed with. Um, so yeah, managing the grazing, we've had all... The only one that I have not seen out of all the species that we've seeded, purple prairie clover, that's another one. Um, the only species that I have not seen is the lead plant. Um, and all the species that we've seeded so far have, have uh, remained established. So, and all those, all these fields that we've done this to, we've, we've put infrastructure in place. We got water on all these fields. And so we manage those all on, you know, one or two day moves, depending kind of on what's going on and that sort of thing. So, and how many on your paddocks about how many acres, um, like, I'm sorry, how, like how big are the, the paddocks acre wise? And then what's your stock rate on, on those paddocks? So we're, we are currently getting, um, so I'll just tell you like a set stock pasture in our area, you would probably get around 30, um, animal days per acre, season long grazing. So that's kind of, you know, I, I really didn't know what to expect, to be honest with you. When we, when I sat down with Jim Garrison, we did this projection, we were hoping by year five that we'd be at 60 animal days per acre. We could harvest off of them. Um, so we really didn't know what to expect. And so that the stocking rate initially, we, we really didn't know what to do. Um, so we've learned that um, year one, we were getting between 30 and 45 animal days per acre. And we were grazing, especially on these kind of these warm season type mixes. They take a long time to establish. So year one, you're grazing a lot of uh, weeds or volunteer cover crops and that sort of thing. Year two, they're really, there's not a lot there. We're only about 15 animal days. But year three, what we've seen, those things just absolutely explode, those mixes. And we're on one pass, we'll take 30 on average, say 30 to 35 animal days. And then we'll, if we go through again, we can take another 20 or so. We have gone through them just one pass and harvested the most we've done so far on a, on a third year mix is a, is around 54 animal days per acre. Um, so I, I'm pleased that we're, we're near, you know, kind of what we were hoping for in year three, you know, we were hoping for in year five, we're kind of seeing that in year three. Um, so I really don't know. I'm anxious to see what these things are going to, what they're going to do. And quite honestly, in the last couple of years have been pretty dry as well. So um, how do they, how do your perennials that you've planted compare to your native grass that you've been doing, that you've been managing um, aggressive? We, um, so our natives, like in our area, the pastures are all pretty small. So they've all been like set stocked for you know, since the beginning of whenever people started doing this thing. Um, so most of our natives, we have some pastures that we've um, been managing our grazing on for <clears throat> say four or five years. Um, but a lot of them, you know, have been set stock up until recently. So <clears throat> these new perennial mixes, the diversity is better. Um, yeah, they just, they're just, incredible compared to our natives there is still some bare soil in our new mixes so hopefully that continues to fill in um what we've seen on our natives though where we've started managing our grazing or some of those warm season big grasses big blue stem switch grass um indian grass starting to come back into those pastures so so that's kind of exciting yep so um when you guys went into this whole process, what was your, um, in 2017, how many cows were you running and how many cows are you running now? Um, so in 2000 and 
17, we were probably in the neighborhood of 100 cows, I suppose. Um, this year, we will calve out in the neighborhood of 180 um, at this point. So, um, yeah, so, and I don't, I'd rather have more grass than too many cows. So, um, so we could probably go higher than that during the grazing, you know, the growing season, but we try to match our stocking somewhat to the, what we have for winter availability as far as cows. Um, so we probably need to be looking more at bringing in some or some flexible stocking as far as either running our own stockers or bringing in some custom grazing, at least through the summer. Um, it's a challenge to get over everything like early when during the fast growth phase of the, you know, the fast growth phase of your grasses and your, your pastures to try to get through them all once to kind of top those off. It's a, it's a challenge. So a lot of times we'll, before we get to a paddock, you know, it might be too mature and the grass, some of those grasses are heading out. So, um, so it, a higher stocking rate would be nice during the growing season. And then to be able to, you know, cut that down in the winter. So, um, yeah, and we also use our cropland a lot as well. So we typically grow um, some full season cover crop mixes as a plan B, a drought plan for um, for us. Like last summer, um, it was really hot and dry. People were selling cattle and pulling them off the grass and starting to feed them. And, and in that time frame, middle of August, we went on to full season cover crops. Um, and then we pulled off of those cover crops and uh, mid-October and we still had 300 acres of stockpile grass that we hadn't even been on yet so awesome. so yeah we were so we utilize that cropland as well in our system so awesome so Kevin tell me about your philosophy in your program with your cattle and what you're what you're building with your herd what are the things that are most important to you as you're building your herd and then you know, talk about some of the the grass finished beef that you guys are selling and how that's working for you. Sure, yeah, we uh, so we were like everybody else, and like when I got out of college, we were chasing low birth weight and a lot of growth, and you know, then pretty soon you have sixteen hundred pound cows or eighteen hundred pound cows that don't fit in the squeeze chute, and we wonder what happened. And so through the years, probably the last ten years, we've really changed to where we've started buying bulls with really just moderate traits and really maternal bulls. And so this last fall, when we preg checked, um, all the cows were fat coming off these cover crops and BCS scores of, you know, six and seven. Um, so my average weight on all my cows this last fall was 1250. So, so we're coming down, um, getting our cow size down. We're getting, a lot of those maternal traits that we were looking for and that that type of animal we're looking for um easy flushing you know easy keeping low maintenance type of cattle um because we we really try to graze 365 days a year that's our goal um so then our uh our grass finish program we uh so we we try to keep most all of our heifers and we breed them um short intervals um so growing up my dad we always bred our heifers 45 days and probably the last i don't know four or five years we've shortened that up and we, we use a 30-day breeding season on our heifers um and then all of the open ones go into our grass finished beef program so we kind of hope for some open ones um and so those those animals that are open then through the winter, we will run those with our uh, weaned heifers. Um, usually they're on cover crop type stuff through the winter or, you know, wheat pasture triticale. So we run our grass finishers with those. And then in the spring, they'll go on to those um, just a lot of diversity. Um, legumes with the alfalfa and the sizer milk vetch in there. And that's where we finish those cattle on usually from say the middle of April and we harvest them all. We're, we do it all seasonally kind of to match what our, our rainfall and forage production is. So 
all of our grass finished beef are harvested in the middle to the end of June. Um, and we've had really good, really good results with it. So a lot of happy customers and, um, yeah, it's just worked really good. So other than now, um, we're not getting enough heifers. Like this last year, we bred 59 heifers in 30 days with two bulls and we got 49 of them pregnant in 30 days. And I was kind of hoping for 20, you know, to be honest yeah. with you. You're the first person to complain about uh, your fertility rates being too yeah. high. So, yeah, that's what the vet says too. Or I'm pretty, I was pretty disappointed that we didn't have 20 because then we got to go to plan B for that as well. Yeah. So this next year, we're going to change that up and probably just hold back a certain number of heifers that we don't expose to make sure that we have enough for, for our program. Um, Yep. So that's kind of how we do that. So, uh, Kevin, you didn't bring this up, but I will. Uh, in my opinion, um, you are as passionate as most seed stock uh, producers, um, mm -hmm. more disciplined in what you're selecting for and um, have you have such a high standard for your cow herd. Where did that come from and, and what drives you as far as like, you know, I get it with seed stock guys being passionate and that's why I became a seed stock guys. Cause I would call up commercial guys and I would call up seed stock guys. And I just found way more seed stock guys that were passionate about what they were doing. Um, but when I talk to you about your standards uh, for fertility, uh, your standards for foot quality and udders and, you know, how you, how you call on your cows and when you select bulls and what your criteria is, where did your passion and, and drive come from to have the, the program that you've built? Uh, mostly probably from my dad, I think that's just how I was taught. Um, and now for me, it's a, it's kind of a, like you say, kind of a passion to kind of produce the type of cows that we want to see on the, on the place. Um, and that kind of flows right into the program where like for our grass finished beef program, you know, that, that type of cow we're trying to create is, is produces the type of animal that, that we want to be able to grass finish and take to market. So, um, and then as far as feet quality and utter um, structure and quality and all that, I mean, that's just a form, you know, that's just comes down to function. You know, we want, the animals got to move across the landscape so we can't have bad feed. And, you know, I'm not going to milk out cows if they have bad udders. So they go to town. So, um, so we just try to create, you know, our cattle that don't have those problems. Yeah. Um, what have you gotten out of doing the farms program? Like when, um, and I guess let me uh, elaborate that on for people who don't know what the farms program is. So uh, a Back in the beginning of 2020, um, I don't know how it came about with the way the government was uh, decided that that some things were broken within RCS and they wanted to create a program that had more accountability and that they were getting the finances to farmers who would do regenerative agriculture and stick with it and try new cutting edge, um, you know, ways to improve soil health. And so, uh, they partnered with the Colorado Conservation Tillage Association um, and created the farms program. And so the farms program, uh, I, I think, do you remember how many is in the program, Kevin? 24. So that they found 24 producers. Um, each producer uh, that's in the program, like me, uh, John Nicewanger and Corey Stevens have a mentor. Kevin is our, our mentor. Uh, and so we picked new uh, processes that we were doing or go, wanted to do. Um, and so like for me, I did interseeding cover crops and um, do I did um, compost extract. And so those were the new practices that, that we did as a part of the farms program and we got funding um, for those practices. So Kevin, what were some of the things that you chose to do in the farms program and what um, what did you, what have you learned from those new practices that you've been applying in your operation? Yeah. Um, so that it's kind of funny. Like I read about that farms 
uh, program. You know, I, I looked at the brochure when that when it came time to enroll, and I was like, no, I'm not going to do this. And I had <laughs> too, much, too much paperwork, so I had a friend of mine. Um, he goes, yeah, let's let's do this. Let's send him in. And so I was like, okay, grudgingly sent him in. Got selected anyway. But um, so so I just want to say that they like they've done a tremendous job, like putting yeah. this program together. The the uh, program coordinators and um, the the admin team, and so it's been for me. I think more than anything has just been the networking, and I got to meet Jay Young and get to know him. You know, and ultimately just build more relationships like that. That's been far and away probably the my favorite thing I've got out of farms. Um, but as far as farm projects, um, my projects where I had one field where we established uh, Kerns on um, the perennial um, wheatgrass developed by the Land Institute, perennial grain. And then um, so we established that field as a monoculture wanting to maximize kind of seed yield, but we wanted to um, in, implement diversity into that system. So kind of my project was to do uh, pasture cropping. So we were seeding diverse warm season um, annual um, cover crop mixes, basically into the kerns after kerns of harvest to try to add diversity to that system. Um, so that was one field. And then the other field, we've kind of been trying to work on companion cropping with, uh, um, yeah, having companions in like our triticale that we would graze and also a um, couple years of companion plants, crops in with our, our uh, Milo grain sorghum. Um, so those are the, those are my two fields and the projects that we've been um, working on. Um, as far as things we've learned, uh, the the companion planting with the Milo, we've we've found some species that have survived and worked pretty well. Um, pretty optimistic about like the yellow blossom sweet clover survived this hot dry summer, and the decorative gourds survived. That was about it. But so we have uh, we harvested the Milo, and we have a on on probably half of the field a, a really good stand of yellow blossom sweet clover still alive and um, plans are this spring to see the cover crop, you know, directly into that. And hopefully the yellow blossom sweet clover will um, take off here in the spring as well and already be established. Um, that is, that is really awesome because that's one, you know, I bought that cover crop, uh, that Henniker interseeder for the purpose of, of being able to see what we can work with, you know, with Milo and corn to keep a living root in the ground over the winter. And so I'm, I'm really excited that you, you did that. What other species that did you try with your Milo that ended up dying? Um, um, so uh, this year we had yellow blossom sweet clover, the decorative gourds, uh, Korean lespedeza, um, and some hubam, white, white clover in there, and, and buckwheat. And the only two that really survived this summer was the decorative gourds and the yellow blossom sweet clover. We did a field in um, 20, would have been like, maybe it was 21. And we had, in that year, we had buckwheat and mung beans in there and those survived. Um, differences in rainfall, I, I suspect, you know, just differences in growing season. Um, yeah, weather. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about the yellow blossom sweet clover. I, I don't know that's something maybe you need to look at too in your in your inner seedings as well. So, yep. Um, yeah, and then on the kerns of field, that's uh, so year we we established that in the fall, planted it in the fall. Um, year one, um, we harvested it for seed grain. And we swapped and baled the straw that was left. And then we seeded our pasture crop mix into that. And it was, and that would have been 2021. Um, a hot, dry summer again from July on. That year we did get the, the pasture crop annuals to emerge. And we probably got six or eight inches of growth was all on those. Um, so not really a success story, I would say. 
um, grazed it in the fall. We took off like 20, a little over 20 animal days off of that in the fall. We were hoping to graze it the spring of 2022, but we've been, you know, our last 15, 16 months, we're a little over 50% of our normal or average precipitation. So we've been um, definitely abnormally dry. So the kerns are really, in 2022, really struggled. We didn't graze at all in the spring. Um, in fact, we did not even harvest it for grain. It really didn't make any viable seed. So we ended up swathing and bailing that. And then we har then we seeded our pasture crop mix into it. And basically none of that even emerged last summer just from lack of, we just never got rains to get it to come up. So, so what I've learned from that is I don't think in my environment that pasture cropping into the cool season grass, monoculture grass, really has, is going to be a economically viable option. I think under irrigation, you could really make that thing go even with the, you know, the seeding, the seeding, the annual um, pasture crop mix into that. I think you could get a lot of grazing out of that. The, I know Keith Harmony up at Hayes, he's a K-State um, range specialist at, at Hayes. He's seen some pretty impressive results with um, basically pasture cropping sorghum sedan into cool season grass like brome. But it takes the rainfall, you know, the moisture to get that done. So I know it is possible, but I don't think in 10 years, you know, I don't think that they would work for us, you know, maybe a third or half the time. So, sure. So for me, but I'm, I'm excited about the Kernza because of all the flexibility it offers. Like we can graze it in the spring, harvest it for seed, swath and bale it if you want, graze it in the fall. Um, so my next venture with Kernza, and I've got a field in mind, we're going to, we're going to try to get, um, we're, we're going to try to get perennial, a, a diverse perennial mix established with the Kernza, um, heavy on legume components to try to provide the nitrogen for the Kernza and, and just add the diversity. Um, hey, yeah, add that biodiversity into the soil as well. Um, so that's kind of my next, I guess, goal for that. I want to be able to one, I want to get away from all the synthetic inputs on the Kernza. Like, like when it's monoculture, we're still applying nitrogen fertilizer. Sure. Um, so I think I think there's going to be potential layer in the organic market if we can get away from those synthetics and and then also be able to, after Kernza harvest, I don't want to swap and bail it. I want to be able to open the gate, manage our grazing to get that Kernza trampled to the ground. So we need something out there that has um, higher forage quality than just Kernza straw that the cattle can eat while they're, you know, they're trampling everything else to the ground. So that's kind of my, what I have my vision and our kind of our next, um, yeah, next idea we're going to try to implement with the currents. So what are, um, on the, on the currents, the aspect of it, you, you planted one quarter and now you're going to do a second quarter here this, this, this year. Um, so we just, just for the farms field, it was, it's just a 20 acre field. Okay. Um, so I've got a, a quarter section in mind that we want to, that we want to plant it to, but it probably just the way it, it's in its cropping sequence now, it probably wouldn't be planted until the fall of, of 24, kind of where we're at, because I want to, you don't just want to plant kerns of like following a cereal, you know, in the fall, we're, we kind of want to put a little forethought into the, the crops before that. Um, to kind of reduce chances for volunteer because you don't want volunteer weed or rye or triticale coming up with your Kernza. Um, so we'll probably, um, that field will be Milo this year. And then we would probably follow that up with a, a cover crop, spring planted cover crop of some sort, and then seed to Kernza in the fall then of 24 would be my, that's my plan at this point. So, Okay. Um, what have you learned from John Nyswanger, myself, and Corey Stevens from the farm? Yeah, probably more than you've learned from me. Um, <laughs> that is not accurate. Um, yeah, so you guys are so far ahead of me with this biology and the, the compost extract and that thing. And that's that's something that we're kind of, my goal for this year is to have extract of some sort, either compost or vermin compost or whatever applied on all my seed at this point for 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 2023 
Um, what I've, I've learned so much from John Meissner. He's like, he's the smartest guy I know when it comes to the sort of thing. That um, I will not argue with. Honestly. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, you know, I've learned all my, everything I know about making a Johnson Sioux bioreactor and, and the compost, that's all come from, from Jay Young. So, uh, and then and Corey's got some experiences as well. Last year he used the compost extract. So, um, so yeah, that's, I'm, that's what I'm excited about learning from you guys. So, cause I think that really is the key, you know, that's one thing I wish that we would have started earlier. You know, we started no tilling in 1997 or whatever, and there really wasn't that focus yet on the biology. And, and that's one thing that I think we really need to look at a lot closer. And it's, and it's something that we're going to start to try to implement and do a lot more of. Yeah. Well, and I was talking to Bryce Custer just about earthworms and bringing back earthworm populations. And, you know, we've been able to see dramatic changes on our irrigated circles with the earthworms. And then you brought uh, for you guys watching Kevin stopped by my place, John's and, and Corey's. Uh, this week as part of the the farms program and him being our mentor he travels and you know goes through our processes and sees what we're doing um, but anyway so like we were at that irrigated circle and you brought up that it's been hard for you to see a, a big change in the earthworm population why do you think that is and and what have you been able to see as far as like dung beetles earthworms and other species that you've seen come back yeah sure and um like I would just comment on your farm under irrigation, like with that extra water and the carbon, like there was so many earthworm holes, like your soil was completely perforated with earthworm holes and you could peel back the residue and just see all the castings on top of the soil um, under irrigation. But then when we walked across the road, basically to a dry land field, you know, that's, it's non-existent. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the difference? You know, water <laughs> plays yeah. a great big part in it and then the carbon that you produce from that that water so for me personally on our land and we see that i mean do we see earthworms yeah we see earthworms depending on the time of the year moisture conditions was it anything like what we saw in your place yesterday no nothing like that um yeah and to be clear i've only found one field where we had earthworms other than like if you have a dry land field that connects to an irrigated field. I, I don't know if it's the, the migration or whatever. I, I've, I'm able to find earthworms on some of those, but stuff that's way far away from our irrigation, some of our best soil, some of the stuff that we've been doing cover crops, uh, the longest one earthworm. Yeah. And even in our native, you know, when we go out, if you go out in the spring or summer when the soils are wet, you can dig and find decent numbers of, you know, of native um, earthworms. But I'm, I don't know, I'm almost convinced, like through the years of doing all this, that it's, you know, part of the soil health principles is to keep your soil covered. Um, and under dry land and brittle environments, and the further south and west you go, you know, across the Great Plains, I, I'm almost convinced that in an under dry land system, I just don't know that it's even possible long term, because we get you know, we go through these dry spells where we're just not producing residue and we, you know, we seed crops and we can't even get them to come up because it's so dry. And then we get these wind events where we lose all of our residue. Um, so that that was another thing that kind of led me down that perennial path was like, OK, if we truly want to keep our soil covered all the time, in my mind, the only way at the time, the only way I could think of to do that was to do what Mother Nature did in our environment. And that was to implement perennials. Yeah. And those fields, you know, we have a 100% cover 365 days a year, regardless of, you know, the weather. So, so that was important to me. So anyway, what other um, biology we've seen? We have, uh, we quit using pour on wormers on all of our cows, probably in the neighborhood of eight years ago, I'm guessing now. And uh, so we have, um, quite a bit of dung beetle activity that's come back and that's pretty cool to see we have and I don't know what kind they are I'm not an expert on dung beetles but 
they're, they're kind of like really perforate the patties, you know, kind of tunnel in there and whatever. Um, but they're not the ones that really just destroy the pat where, you know, after 24 hours, you can't even see it. So I don't know what it's going to take to get those critters to come in, but. Um, Do you guys have the, the fat green ones? Ours are little black ones. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Once in a while you'll see the big ones, you know, the rollers and stuff, but not, not in huge numbers. So, um, so that's been cool to see. Um, we have a lot of diversity now, especially in those, those diverse perennials. We see just so much life in there. I mean, like we pull in there to move cattle and you shut off the four wheeler and you just sit there and observe, you know, and, and just, it smells so good, you know, with all these different plants blooming in there and you can just hear the, the insects, you know, buzzing and, and the birds. And it's just really a very peaceful thing. Like we can actually see that we're healing the ecosystem, you know, in our area here. So, um, so yeah, I think, you know, the birds and the insects, those are all key indicators of a healthy ecosystem. And, and we have certainly seen an increase in that. So, yeah. Well, I think that's always kind of blows my mind when you you get on the social media forums and they're about regenerative agriculture. And then you get these people who are, you're not regenerative if you spray any kind of uh, oh, uh, herbicide. And I'm I'm I was I'm I can't I mean if you me or anybody else from Hayes Kansas to Denver Colorado could get away from spraying uh, glyphosate and paraquat and all the other nasty things that we hate we would absolutely I mean part of the problem is is we 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 have to be able to control weeds and you know like it, it just blows my mind when you're trying to do the right thing and then you you're on a social media forum and you see somebody that you respect that's been a mentor to you and they're just getting blasted by multiple people who are telling them that that you know they're they're not really regenerative because they're not organic right and that's i mean i will tell you that you know there's a lot of times we'll do one herbicide pass in like a 15 or 16 month period um where we used to maybe do four or five. Yep, same. So we've we have easily reduced our herbicide applications by half, if not two thirds, yep. um, at the times of the year. Doing what we're doing with cover crops and on our annuals, we're talking about here annual cropping, um, and we've we've reduced our nitrogen use on our warm season crop, like our Milo. Um, we've reduced so far, we've reduced our nitrogen by about 40%. Um, so we're seeing those benefits, but yeah, I'd love to be, like you say, I'd love to not have to, I'd love to sell my sprayer and not have to apply any of that stuff. Um, and again, the only place that I do that is where I've done my perennial sequences. Um, so we've got no inputs whatsoever, no commercial synthetic inputs, just managing grazing and animal impact. Um, so that's what we're trying to do there is, you know, regenerate the soil. And then again, like I talked about with, you know, just soil cover, you know, how can we keep cover on our soil all the time out here in our context? Well, to me, it was perennials. How can we, how can we uh, totally eliminate herbicide and tillage and fertilizer? Well, we can do that with perennial systems as well. Um, so yeah, that's all that stuff's kind of led me on this path of, of implementing perennial sequences. So, yeah. So Kevin, um, when, when you guys are, are, are making like your grazing plan, like, do you make a plan at the beginning of the year for that? Or how do, how do you do your, your grazing plan for, for 2023? Yeah, we'll, I'll I'll sit down and and just fill out the grazing chart, the holistic management grazing chart, um, and we kind of use the history as far as how many animal days we think we can get off paddocks and that sort of thing, and we kind of plan our rest that way for the for the pastures and the paddocks. Um, so that's always plan A 
And then usually about two days into the grazing season, you're on to plan B already, you know? So, um, but at least you have a plan and you have an idea where these animals are going to be moving. Um, and, you know, Derek, the gentleman that works for me, he has a, he can kind of see, you know, or we, I can kind of relate to him. Okay. This is the plan. We're going to move from here to here, to here, to here this year. And, and then the next year we switch it up and, and do something different. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much what we do there. Um, in the winter time, I just, I, uh, we do a lot of grazing on milo stocks or stockpiled, um, cover full season cover crops or cover crops that were planted after wheat harvest, um, or grazing like wheat pasture, triticale rye, that sort of thing as well. I, I try not to plan like a stockpile graze on my perennial systems. And that's kind of my plan B for winter because there are years like this year where we don't have as much cover crop um, stockpile out there just because of the dry summer. So, so then we can, if we need to, we can go back and, and stockpile graze those, those perennials. I try to always, like I say, I'd rather have way more grass, way more forage than we have cattle. Yeah. Um, Kevin, uh, as we wrap up, what are your goals that you came up with and, you know, how does that tie into what drives you and, and what, you know, makes the decisions that you make on your farm? As far as the goal that we create, created at Ranching for Profit? Yeah. And like the vision that you have for your farm and, and what are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Right. Um, so I'll just read you my goal off my phone here. Okay. It was, and we did this in 2017. It starts in five years, which the five years have come and gone. And we're pretty much, we're about to this goal, but this is like continual, you know, I can take the in five years off now. This still just remains our goal, but we want a business that provides sustainable profit and financial freedom. The business will allow for quality family time and provide an inner environment where children may return if they desire. The business will consist of simple, low input enterprises, the business healthy ecosystem. The business will provide an enjoyable work atmosphere with passionate employees, and we will manage for what we want, not against what we don't want. So that pretty much remains our goal today. And like I say, those that was, comp, um, that was taken from both things that Manny and I sat down and, and, and did together. And uh, so, yeah, we, we've come a long way to reach that goal in the last five years, building our system where we want the flexibility, the resilience, the diversity, um, a low input, low cost um, business. And that's what we've developed. We've installed lots of water lines and fencing and and we've, you know, we can easily integrate all of our crop land and these, these uh, perennial seedings have given us, you know, that perennial base to, to keep a cow herd. Um, so, yeah, that, I mean, that's just kind of the business we build. We, we can grow, we try to grow crops that we can, you know, I want to have multiple uses. I want to be able to harvest them for grain or harvest them for seed or graze them or hay them or, you know, or just use them for a cover crop and, um, and not rely on government you know subsidized crop insurance or government payments and that sort of thing and and we've come a long way towards meeting that goal and i'm i'm really pleased where we're at today and and kind of proud of what we've accomplished so far so awesome well kevin thank you so much for being on young red angus live uh, i've really enjoyed having you tonight um for you guys watching, uh, Kevin, where uh, where are you, all you going to speak here? Is it is Burlington the last go round that you have coming up? Yeah, I'm, I won't even be at. Well, I'll be at Burlington. So if you see me, you're welcome to come up and ask me questions. But uh, so I'm done speaking for the year. I spoke at where I it was five times before New Year's here. Um, so now it's time for me to sit back and learn some more, and then take a break from from doing that and try to implement some new things this year and, and, uh, 
kind of just get re-energized myself. So, yeah. If you guys want to see more of Kevin, I have a YouTube video of Kevin giving a presentation in Burlington uh, from 2020. And then I'm way behind. I've got another video of Kevin presenting in Colorado that I have not got up on YouTube yet. So <laughs> the funny thing is, is like, you know, most people be like, hey, where's that video? that uh that you took like why haven't you put it up and you're like i'd prefer you not to even put it I up yeah I'm, yeah jay is my uh technology whatever guru <laughs> if it wasn't for jay i wouldn't be on on this that's for sure so well i i appreciate you coming um so guys for next week i don't have a planned guest i'm going to be speaking in Oklahoma, and then in Salina, Kansas. Uh, if I find somebody I can drag uh, to YouTube Live, I, I will. But if I'm zonked, I probably will just skip YouTube Live next week. And then the following week, we will have Corey Miller on uh, talking about what they've done with uh, Johnson Sue Compost. So again, th Kevin, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for watching at home. And that concludes this episode of Young Red Angus Live. Thanks, Jay. No problem.